Okay. Um, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here to share some of my experiences. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I have worked at uh, the DNC, but I also worked at some tech companies. Uh, I worked at uh, Twitter as their first security hire and, and Yahoo. But before that, I worked at a company that did things like this. Anybody recognize any of these? Anybody recognize Netscape? Please, please, just sympathy, just thank you, thank you. Okay, I want to say I have more hair back then, but you know. Um, and so I worked on identity way back in the day, and so I'm so excited that we are on the cusp of a mass adoption of strong authentication. And uh, so I'm just, I'm just tickled to be here. Now, one of the things I always start off every slide deck with is this idea that we're up against dedicated human adversaries who work in campaigns. And we, we think that we know this, but I would argue we don't really act like we know this. And one of the things that I tell people is that the attackers that we're up against today, they're dedicated. They show up in teams of people. They wear military fatigues to work every morning or maybe flip-flops and, and cargo shorts. But this is what they do. They work to, th to subvert all of the things that we want to do. They're human, which means they get to decide what to do when you all employ better security. They know that it happens, and they get to find ways to subvert it. And they work in campaigns, which means, well, it can take years. They'll chip away at the problem year after year after year. And I think we see this general sense that we, we don't really think about this, this idea often enough. And one of the things I want to talk about is this clear and present danger. Um, now, this is the kind of idea that means that people don't love to talk to me at cocktail parties because I tell them all the ways in which things can go terribly wrong. And, but I, I do think that we're on the cusp of, of some very dangerous things. But I want to rewind a little bit and talk about some experiences that maybe some of you had. Anybody remember the objections to HTTPS for all connections? There have to be a few people. Yeah, people, people did not want HTTPS for all network connections. Performance costs, Bob. We're gonna have to buy a lot more machines. We're gonna have to have new teams of people trained to maintain this. We're gonna not see any ROI. Nobody really cares. Customers aren't asking for it. Just people like you, Bob. And it breaks advertising workflow. So we definitely want advertising money, so don't love that. Um, and we actually have it for the portion of the workflow that really matters, which is login. That's what they told us. And for the love of God, there just aren't any real world attacks. So we're not, we're not gonna do it. And then, Firesheep. Anybody remember this? Yeah, a few people, a few people remember Firesheep. So Eric Butler released this tool as a Firefox plugin. And what it would do is it would sniff on the network, on your local network. And if it saw session cookies from services it knew about, like Twitter and Facebook, it would hijack those cookies and you would then have given them your credentials, basically. And so they could just sniff the wire and become you. And this was a big problem. And you know, internal to a lot of organizations, there were people who were advocating for HTTPS across the entire site without a lot of success. This tool started to get the motions going forward. And, and that's a bit of a shame because we kind of knew this day was coming, but we, and we had the tools to, to, to do the right thing, protect our site but we didn't use it. And so Firesheep was really a great sensitizing event. It caused us to understand what could happen. I would argue this was already happening with malicious actors, but they didn't advertise it. So we didn't know. These were invisible attacks. And, and so I wonder, were there, are there things that we should be thinking about now with regard to identity and access management? I think yes. Anybody remember this Twitter hack? This was only a year ago. This really freaked me out, not just because I used to run the security program at Twitter, but because what happened was these adversaries called up support people, tech people, and they tricked them into going to a certain website controlled by the hackers, and then they were uh, instructed to enter their credentials, but not just their name and password, but also multi-factor authentication codes. I would argue if this had been the kind of attack that you saw against uh, some sort of SaaS provider, it would have been much more of a kick in the pants than it was. People thought, oh, it's just Twitter, it was just a prank, they were trying to get some Bitcoin, and then people just kind of let it go. But I think about this hack almost every single day because this is the sort of thing that can happen almost anywhere. 
and it is. So if you take a look at the news, and I, I got tired of like grabbing the latest screenshots and dumping them into my slide deck, but on a regular basis, we see articles where these phishing attacks, they're bypassing two-factor. Tool automates phishing attacks that bypass 2FA. Of course they're automating it. That's what the attackers do. They work in long-term campaigns, and of course they're gonna be building efficiencies here. Rise of one-time password interception bots. Or how about the company that routes SMS for all major US carriers was hacked for five years. Now you have to wonder about SMS two-factor when you see something like this. Over the next year, I suppose we'll find more information about what this attack really looked like, but this really is, I think, uh, an important thing for us to track. So, the way that I think about things, there's a new reality. There are two types of, of MFA today. FIDO security keys, and you see where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> Everything else, <laughs> right? Legacy two-factor that you need to replace. And I call it legacy because I wanna put into your mind the idea that this is something that you need to contain and you need to eradicate. And it needs to be part of your formal plan. So if you're an IT person working on the inside of an enterprise, you need to eradicate this. If you are a service provider offering services to either enterprises or consumers, you need to think about eradicating it as well, whether it's SMS, authenticator, app push, whatever it is. And the situation is likely to become super urgent, seemingly out of nowhere, seemingly overnight. This is something that we have seen the, the early warning signs of, and we know that these ded dedicated human adversaries are gonna come for these assets. So, I think this is the year. What is this the year of? Well, it's this next year is going to be the year both of FIDO, so I see really great warning signs that FIDO is going to be successful, but also the year that the attacks really start to ramp up. And, uh, and so I think this is the year that we all need to find ways to reach out to other communities outside of our own filter bubble and find ways to convince them to move down this path too. But it's not just me who's saying this, the federal government is saying this as well. So the US federal zero trust strategy includes this line. They want agency systems to require, um, they want them to discontinue support for authentication methods that fail to resist phishing. Hey, just like the last slide, SMS, one-time codes, push notifications. And what they want is for agencies to prioritize the rapid implementation of things like PIV or WebAuthn. And so they're putting this into the standards that are now gonna become part of what the federal government is going to be deploying. So I think this is a great addition to our overall efforts, but it's clearly not going to be sufficient. So um, at the DNC, I was privileged to have uh, the ability to participate in a couple of interesting deployments. So you've all heard of the DNC, yes, of course, and you've all heard of the issues that happened in 2016. So I joined in 2018, and one, <laughs> just want to make that clear. And, and so I wanted to do a few things. One is I did my little Marie Kondo bit where I looked at servers and services and I asked myself, does this spark joy? <laughs> and if it didn't, I got rid of it. Now, it's easier said than done. You all know that. It took a lot of work, but I got rid of a lot of technical debt. The other thing which you might imagine that I would do is I wanted to start building a foundation of good security practices. And I had the opportunity to start deploying FIDO security keys. And so we started to do that with quite a lot of rigor. And so it's the case today that if you're a DNC staffer and you need to log into the systems at the DNC, you have to use FIDO security keys. And, and the team is just really uh, rigorous with applying that and making sure that people don't fall through the cracks. And, and so I think this is an interesting little subcase. You know, there's not, not a million people at the DNC, just a few hundred. But I think it's an interesting proof that it can be done. But you're probably saying, but what about larger organizations, Bob? That's all fine for an organization that you got to really build to your standards. Well, let me tell you about this thing called the coordinated campaign. The coordinated campaign was an effort uh, to, uh, in the run-up to the presidential election, to hire a whole bunch of people who, in the before times, would go and knock on doors and tell people, hey, the election is coming up on whatever the day it is, and we'd like to make sure that you're gonna vote, and we have some suggestions for how you might wanna vote. 
things like that. And so they couldn't quite do that during the pandemic, uh, but they were able to set up little virtual town halls and sort of virtually knock on people's doors. And, uh, and so this was another group that we had to stand up and get secured. Obviously, it had the DNC's brand associated with it, so there was a lot of reputational um, uh, risk associated with that. So this was much larger than the DNC. There were about you know, 3,200 people. And most of the folks had to use security keys despite a whole bunch of setbacks. Like, I mean, this is a real point of friction. Coordinated campaigns, like any campaign, they're pop-up businesses. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end, which means that you have a short period of time and the day after the election is too late to do anything. You can't change anything. You can't say, I'll do it again next quarter. I'll get it right next time. At the end of the uh, election, it's over. And there are no headquarters or regional offices where people can go to during a pandemic. It was all completely distributed. We had pandemic supply chain issues. If any of you tried to order, uh, like we had to order Chromebooks for folks and security keys, some of those orders were delayed. And we were competing with schools and other businesses throughout the entire country. The coordinated campaign, those folks are not technical. So when I worked at Yahoo or when I worked at uh, Twitter, a lot of the folks were technical, obviously. We didn't have that with a coordinated campaign. These folks came from all walks of life. And these were all new hires, and it was a new company, so we had no existing cultural reference points. So that's a challenge. And people were starting every single week up until the election, which means that during those last few weeks, it's almost impossible to get them uh, you know, the hardware provisioned and, and security keys out. And despite all of that, we got about 80% of the people using security keys. And, and you're asking yourself, well, what sort of data were, were they protecting? Well, I mean, most of the data was just public. So these are presentations that would go out to, uh, to local groups, to uh, organizers. So it wasn't you know, the sort of mission critical uh, data that you would have if you're a financial services company or if you're uh, an insurance company. But we still wanted to protect it with the best of breed technology. And so I think there's some interesting lessons and best practices here. One is we have some existence proofs. It is possible to quickly roll out security keys to a mid-size organization and a remote workforce during some unpleasant uh, conditions. Uh, we use the DNC's prior successes as a template for the larger coordinated campaign. In other words, we didn't try to reinvent the wheel. We tried to figure out, can we move most of those, those processes from the DNC to the coordinated campaign? And most of them, not all of them, but most of them we did move forward. We started early. So from the first day, we really worked on indoctrinating people to understand that this was an important effort. And, and when I say we really pushed on this, I mean we really pushed on this. The first class that you would go to, the first experience working with the DNC or with the coordinated campaign was the security briefing. So we worked to make sure that was the first one. And the second one was the IT onboarding, where you'd get your accounts, things like that. If you missed the security briefing, they kicked you out of the IT onboarding. And you were told to go back to your manager and find another day to get onboarded. And we had a zero tolerance, zero policy, uh, tolerance policy for that. And part of that was making sure that HR was really uh, in our camp. We can't do the thing I just mentioned, where we kick people out of an onboarding session unless HR is willing to defend that. So that was not trivial, but we had a great HR team, and they did exactly the right thing. We also had to spend a lot of time hunting for scofflaws. But scofflaws, you know, sometimes they're people who just aren't able to do it for whatever reason. And sometimes, based on other identity workflow, they may fall out of the system. And so we had to be on top of it. Every single day, we had to run reports to find out who was not fully enrolled in security keys. And of course, we had to find lots of different ways to meet people where they are. Documentation, office hours, sometimes one-on-one -on -one sessions, although that's, that's difficult to scale. And we pushed a lot of things off to the management chain so that they did the dirty work of explaining to people why security was important. It's fine for the security team to say security is important to people. They expect that. What's critical is for different parts of the organization, the management chain, to say, it's actually a, a core value of mine and so you're gonna do it for that reason. And we spent a lot of time pushing vendors to make sure that the backend systems worked the way that we needed them to. 
running reports to find the scofflaws, for example. If you end up using the same vendors that we used, you're welcome. I think we've gotten through most of those. If you're using different vendors who haven't gone through this sort of process, you're going to have to budget some time to work with them to make the deployments simpler. So I recommend that you and your friends and your friends' friends, if you're talking about an enterprise deployment, I think you need to have a real sense of urgency. And one of the recommendations I have is to start presenting burn down charts to senior executives. If you send them one, they're gonna ask for the next, trust me on this. And this is a way to hold the entire organization accountable. And to do things in phases. And I recommend that people start thinking about what can you do in 2021. And I know there's just a few weeks left, but the hardest part is really just starting. And a lot of, um, a lot of what we have as data is no longer in our basements and our on-prem systems. A lot of organizations have moved to cloud-based services. So that's where the data is, which means that's where the attacks are gonna go. And so if all of the vendors that we use as SaaS providers, if we've given them our data and their employees are not using FIDO security keys, that means that they're susceptible to the same attack that got Twitter. And so again, back to the, the sense of urgency, I think this is something we need to work on together, is getting vendors to commit to internal folks using um, FIDO security keys. The, and again, this problem is gonna come up seemingly overnight, so we need to get ahead of that crisis. So, uh, we did run into a few speed bumps here and there. Um, one of them is I asked myself, how can we leverage the existing successes of MFA, of legacy MFA? And I started looking for data, and I get some data like this, meaning maybe the, the successes of legacy MFA aren't so great. So here's Twitter saying 2.3 of their accounts use any form of MFA. That's a, that's a challenge. Um, what about other, other organizations? Well, here's Microsoft, and so a couple weeks ago they released this digital defense report, and it says that only 20% of users and 30% of global admins are using MFA. Not even one third of admins? What? Like, how could this be? Well, it is, and I think we have to factor that into the, to the work that we're doing to deploy security keys. And I really hope that other vendors su uh, support this idea of releasing some transparency around this. We can't improve if we don't measure it. And I'd love to see specifically trends over time, the type of 2FA that's used, and a clear separation between consumer and enterprise customers. I think this is a critical distinction that I don't really have, other than this one Microsoft uh, data point, I don't really have any clarity about what that looks like. I suspect it's not great. And stats per country and anything else that might help us collectively move things forward. So I talked about things like SaaS providers, MSPs, needing to mandate FIDO for their customers and staff, getting metrics. Some other things that we ran into, UX issues. And so one of the issues is we have different terms and flow. If you go, uh, help somebody, and I encourage you to do this if you haven't done this already, get a non-technical friend or relative and then enroll them in security keys on some site. Then help them log in uh, and enroll on another site. And you're gonna find that it's very frustrating because the flow is different, the terms are different. And you're gonna run into that. And so I think that's one of the speed bumps that we ran into. Uh, tracking which keys go where. So I just got this new key and I enrolled it in this one thing. What about, where else should I be enrolling it? People keep spreadsheets, and I think that's something else that we should talk about. When I ask uh, people what is it that you're, and when I actually watch people do this, when they go to name their security keys, they'll, they'll name them after their kids or their pets. Is that good, is that bad? I'm not really sure, but I ran into that on a regular basis. There are things like um, the SSO tax, and if you're not familiar with this, go to sso.tax, it's actually a URL. And so the basic idea here is that there are many service providers that when you ask them to provide their service using a single sign-on provider, they charge you more because they think that's an enterprise thing and you guys can pay for it. I've seen vendors charge more for FIDO support. And I don't think any of these security mechanisms should be charged as a luxury good. And so I think we need to encourage people to start stepping back and saying, this is something closer to a human right than it is to uh, you know, trying to get the most amount of money from, from, uh, from folks. I also run into cases where I enroll in FIDO security keys, but the site doesn't then deprovision legacy two-factor. And that means we are susceptible to downgrade attacks. So I think we should talk more about that as well. 
Having said all that, none of these speed bumps should slow anybody down. These are just things you're gonna bump into and you should recognize that that's the case. And so what is it that you can do? Well, if you're a service owner, we just need more FIDO support. And if you're gonna be building out the system, please look to see what other vendors have done. It's important that we start to build consistency of flow. If you're an administrator, deploy phase one right away, whatever that is. The hardest part is starting the journey. If you're a chief security officer, and I confess this is a hard one, I, don't, I had modest successes in this space, but pushing vendors to support FIDO for their organization, for their staff. And I'm wondering what are, the, what are the verticals that are not fully included in a conference like this? We need to reach those organizations. Um, again, if you're a senior executive, we need you to start asking for burn down charts for your internal organization. And if you're an end user, give it a try. It's kind of fun, actually. So, um, so I think that we have this looming crisis. We've seen all the early warning indicators, and we have the right tools, thanks to all of you. But I really don't think that we're being loud enough. So one of the things that I do is I go out to speak to lawyers. Eh, not the most fun. but. Um, so there are places where lawyers go to get continuing education credits. And sometimes to get those credits, they have to listen to people like me talk about security. And I push FIDO on a regular basis. But we need to get outside of our bubbles and push these other verticals because frankly, I talk to CISOs all the time and even CISOs don't all understand the value proposition that FIDO brings. So if they don't understand it, they're not gonna be powerful messengers. So I think we need to do a lot better at that. So, Let's get out there, let's get loud. I'll be around the conference. I'm so excited to be here. You can find me on Twitter, of course, and uh, look forward to, uh, to chatting with you in the halls. Thank you.